Hey everyone, welcome to today's video about how account abstraction works. This is actually one that I've been wanting to know for a while, so I was actually really excited to research it and it's pretty cool. So anyway, let's jump into it. Okay, before we even talk about account abstraction, it's really important understanding what the problem is. So traditionally in EVM-based blockchains, uh, you have two types of accounts. Uh, in case you didn't know. The first is known as EOAs, and the second are smart contracts. So EOAs stands for, I think I just said it, externally owned accounts. This is really the stuff that when you get a hardware wallet or you have MetaMask uh, or like a mobile wallet, you traditionally get spun up with an EOA. It's really just a public and private key. A smart contract, on the other hand, is kind of like an EOA, except what makes a smart contract well is it basically has the ability to store and execute code. And that's what makes smart contract well, it's different to normal EOA accounts on an EVM based blockchain. Now, both of them have their upsides and downsides. The upside of an EOA is they're really cheap to spin up. In fact, they cost nothing because you just have to generate two large prime numbers and you get an EOA. The downside is in order for you to do anything with this EOA, it needs ETH um, or some sort of like native gas token or some sort of token to pay uh, gas fees on the network that it's on. So you can have an EOA, but it's kind of useless for anything on chain until it has ETH. Um, and when I say ETH, I mean specifically ETH. If you sent the CEOA stable coins, it's still kind of useless because it needs ETH to actually make the transaction. Smart contract wallets on the other hand are great because they're so much more flexible in what you can do with them. Uh, you can bake in like some unique security rules and you can have multiple people, people access an account with limits and uh, enable social recovery. There are all these like cool features we can get into, but Fundamental problem is they're expensive at the end of the day, uh, and they still require ETH to deploy and spin up. So these aren't necessarily like technical problems, but they're more so UX issues. Um, and this is kind of like the bit that I think like crypto has really struggled with, where you have your friend Bob and you say, hey Bob, you should really get on the blockchain. This thing is great. He's like, cool. He gets his uh, MetaMask account set up, which is already hard in itself. And then he's like, now what? And then say you're Alice, you say, here's 10 USDC. He's like, great, now what do I do with this 10 USDC? And you say, well, you can spend on stuff. And he says, well, how? And he's like, oh, I forgot, you actually just need some Ethereum uh, to send this USDC, but he's like, uh, what do you mean? I've already got the USDC in my account. He says, well, actually, no, you need to be able to pay for gas fees. And he's like, well, what are gas fees? And you explain him about uh, gas price and gas costs. Before you know it, it's like what was meant to be a simple task of sending your friend 10 USDC has uh, turned him into basically bringing him down the crypto rabbit hole. And not only that, the other problem is that he's like, well, what if I lose these magical 12 words um, that secure my account, you say, well, you basically lose, basically lose all your money. So while it's in their traditional sense, if I was to kind of summarize it, A, they're like hard to set up, um, plus I guess like use in some sense, uh, they don't have much like many recovery options available where in fact it's the meme of your entire net worth is in 12 or 24 words definitely holds true. Um, and the other bit is it kind of doesn't allow nuance and sophistication about how you spend the money. So you can't really set fine grained limits on like an EOA of saying, I can only spend this much money um, from my phone or I can spend this much money from uh, another account that I have. So these are kind of like some really big issues we see uh, perpetually with how uh, I think the current structure has worked and there's been attempts over the years through uh, meta transactions and gasless transactions to smoothen out this experience but it's still fundamentally been really hard um 
I think smart contracts are a great step in the right direction. There's wallets like Argent out there uh, that make the experience smooth, but they have to do a lot of, uh, I guess, like, hacks. Not hacks, like, a lot of unsustainable or, like, very janky kind of things to enable a really smooth user experience. It's not one that can scale for everyone uh, who uses an open network uh, blockchain. So I think through the problems we kind of event inevitably talked about the features needed for mainstream adoption. So uh, let's actually get into more of the account abstraction stuff. Now that we've defined the problem, what account abstraction aims to fundamentally do is solve all these problems in a way that fundamentally makes sense. Now, the idea for account abstraction um, has actually been going on since 2020 from the research that I did in the form of various uh, EIPs. Uh, if you don't know what that means, that's Ethereum, and I need to stop doing these, uh, improvement proposals. Um, and the way it kind of works is you have a bunch of developers in the ecosystem to come together, and they decide on some sort of standard or format, and assuming there's consensus amongst the parties, it gets pushed to the protocol, and you now get the new Ethereum. Now, the problem with trying to enable something like uh, account abstraction in the past where you can have this way that um, if I was just to like very quickly jump back to the problem, a lot of the core problem comes back to like the experience of spinning up a new wallet. If there's a way that Bob can receive 10 USDC into his wallet and then pay for stuff without having to also send an ETH to this wallet, that actually solves a lot of onboarding issues in the ecosystem. So a lot of the kind of problems that account abstraction has tried to solve since 2020 has been like, how do we eliminate this process of needing Ethereum uh, for every transaction needed um, for a first time user experience? And even an ongoing one for that matter. So anyway, um, there's been like a bunch of proposals that have come up or proposed EIPs over the years, but none of them have really made it through until 4337. That's the number of the Ethereum improvement proposal that enables account abstraction. So here's how it kind of works. In actually, before I explain how it works, let me explain how a normal transaction works for those of you that don't know. Basically, when I'm a user on chain, oh, this guy's legs are a bit messed up. Anyway, um, let's say we've got Bob and he says, uh, I want to send one ETH, more or less. This basically, uh, he will sign off with his magical private key. That's meant to be a key, I promise. Uh, and it basically gives this uh, hash, which uh, is basically a signed message of his intent of sending one Ethereum. And he gets this message and he distributes it to the network uh, to what is known as a mempool. Um, and the mempool is basically a place where all of these signed user messages kind of live. And then basically miners will take something from the mempool and include it into a block, uh, which has a bunch of these transactions from the mempool put in. I've explained this in like previous videos. So if you don't know what this is, uh, actually I'd recommend watching the what is MEV video, but I just want to give this quick context for those of you that may have not known about it. So the way I, uh, EIP4337 works is that there's actually a new type of transaction. Um, and just to differentiate this, and it's called a user operation. So the idea is that a user can create um, this user operation, which basically says, here's kind of what I want to do. Now, many user operations, uh, let me just... So let's say the user has uh, three user operations, right? All of these three actually can be bundled together uh, by what is known as a bundler. <laughs> I promise you this isn't made up. Um, and what the bundler will then do uh, is bundle these user operations and create what's known as a bundle transaction. So just to re-clarify, these user operations actually go to a different kind of mempool. Um, 
I don't know what the name of Nepal is called, but it's like, let's just call it special Nepal. So in our previous example, uh, where Bob wants to send one to eat, let's say he wants to instead send 10 USDC, and then maybe uh, he also wants to send one USDT to someone. So these would more or less be two user operations. And these user operations would get sent to the special mempool, and the special mempool would contain these user operations that would then get bundled together by a bundler into what is known as effectively a bundle transaction. Now, this bundle transaction then <laughs> gets sent to what is known as an entry point uh, contract. Now, this entry point contract is actually special. Um, it's uh, there's only one that exists on the network. Uh, so in Ethereum, there's a special entry contract and it's already been deployed as far as I'm aware. Um, so you have to send your bundle transaction or validate your bundle transaction with the entry point contract. Now, what the entry point contract will do when it gets this bundle transaction is fundamentally three things. The first is, did the user uh, actually sign off on the user operation, right? So when we examine the user operations here, here, and here, his user actually used their private key to ensure this is a valid operation. That is the first thing that this entry point will check when it receives a bundle transaction submitted to it by a bundler that contains the user operations. The second thing it's gonna do is validate whether the paymaster did indeed sign off on this. Now you're probably wondering what the hell is a paymaster? And that's a great question. <laughs> so remember how earlier before we said that uh, up here was it, we basically need to spend ETH in order to like make this transaction go through. That actually didn't really change in the network um, with this new account abstraction design. Instead, what it really meant was it meant that someone else can pay for that uh, transaction with ETH just from a different, I guess, like point in the transaction sequence. So when you submit a bundle transaction, there's actually another contract, and this is pertaining to the developer uh, who is trying to implement account abstraction, and it's called a paymaster. So the paymaster also, more or less, without kind of getting into details, needs to sign off on whether it did, did in fact agree uh, to pay for this bundle transaction and the costs associated with it. So the entry point will kind of ask like, hey, paymaster, like, is this all kosher? And it's like, yeah, it is. And assuming um, the paymaster is okay with it, uh, the entry point contract will, will validate it. Assuming that has also been done, uh, essentially, let me see. Um, cool, yeah. Assuming that validation has actually happened, the third step that then happens is the transaction, or sorry, the bundle transaction, which is a series of user operations or a collection of user operations, will basically be executed. And the ETH that's required um, to pay for the transaction is pulled from the paymaster and distributed, uh, basically pulled from the entry con point, con sorry, distributed to the entry point contract and subsequently the miners that mined that uh, bundle transaction. So that's like, kind of it in its essence. There are some more complex rules that require the paymasters to stake some ETH to avoid DDoSing and overloading the system, but that gets a bit too complex for this video fundamentally. Um, but yeah, at a high level, that's kind of like how this works. So the all stuff around account abstraction, there's really gonna be this new special mempool that contains a series of operations and you can have bundlers who bundle these user operations together to create a bundle transaction, which gets submitted to an entry point contract here. The entry, pay, entry point contract will make a bunch of validations. Assume those validations uh, hold true, it will execute the transaction, pull the ETH required from the paymaster, 
to ensure the transaction gets executed. So it means that there's no like change to the consensus layer of the Ethereum blockchain. It doesn't break existing contracts and it's quite elegant. It, it is complex. I just explained this is like, okay, this is quite a lot to wrap your head around, but fundamentally um, it solves a lot of the UX issues that I guess like blockchain user experience has. And I think fundamentally the way that I kind of like view this is it allows multiple parties um, to almost like collaborate on a transaction, um, which I think is really cool. So with this, it means we can now have uh, like that first time user experience for wallets entering into the ecosystem is gonna be far more smoother and uh, not so daunting. And yeah, that's really kind of about it for this video. Um, I hope this made sense. This is quite technical to understand, but when you kind of zoom out and understand the essence of it, it all kind of makes sense. So anyway, that's about it. Um, if you have any other requests, let me know in the comments below and look forward to hearing from you guys soon. See ya, bye.